Too much. 
got victory. All right, praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Uh, we do have prayer Thursday at 5, and then Sunday, regular service, 10 o'clock. And then some point here in the near future, Lord willing, on a Sunday, uh, we will do a communion service. So that could be this Sunday, the following Sunday. Um, could be Christmas Eve. What better way to celebrate his birth than recognizing why he came. So, uh, But I'd like to do communion when we kind of have everybody here, or most of the church body here. So um, it's a serious service. You know, we do reflect. And uh, so I want to encourage everyone to kind of be in that attitude and that mindset. And God willing, we'll uh, have one of these Sundays where most of the church bodies here and we'll do communion. Sound good? Okay, praise God. I appreciate Timothy and I've asked him to preach tonight. And I want him to come in Jesus' name and deliver the word of God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's continue to give him some praise here for a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, Jesus. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Everyone doing good? Awesome. Love it. Um, I'm going to be reading out of Genesis chapter 19. I'm going to start in verse 12. If you're there, say amen. I guess everyone's there. <laughs> Genesis 19 and verse 12. And just a little bit of backstory here before we get into the text. Um, Lot is living in the city of Sodom. Uh, we, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked city that turned away from God and rampant with sin and God destroyed. So here we see Lot, and these angels came to visit Lot and his family. And here we are in verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So the Lord sent these angels to destroy the city because of its wickedness. And Lot went out and he spoke unto his son-in-law, which married his daughters and said, uh, and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Other translations will say that his son-in-laws thought that he was joking. They thought that he was just messing with them. They didn't believe him. And when the morning arose, and the angels hastened their lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Get out of here before you're destroyed with the rest of them. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, and he said, Escape for your life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all this plain. Escape unto the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou showest unto me in saving my life. I can't escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, the city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. There's a little village I can escape to. The mountains are too dangerous. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not, little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted the concerning this thing, and I will not overthrow the city for which thou hast spoken. It's okay, go to the village. I won't destroy the village that you go to. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. 
Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all of its inhabitants of the cities that grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. You can all be seated. And she, she looked back, she disobeyed the angel's warning and she became a pillar of salt. What a way to go out. Choices are important. God cares about the choices that we make. Life is kind of this journey that's just riddled with all these choices. Uh, we have countless decisions to have to make as we go throughout our lives. As soon as we wake up, we're met with decision after decision after decision. We have choices like, what am I gonna wear today? What do I want for breakfast? Do I even want breakfast? I should definitely get a protein bar instead of sugary fruity pebbles. Some decisions are more crucial that we make in our life. How are we gonna raise our children? How are we gonna live our life? What type of choices are we gonna make? Are we gonna stop for coffee in the morning? What are we gonna order? Are we gonna be one of those people that tries to do a caffeine fast so we can be grumpy throughout the day? <laughs> At least if you're me. Decisions. The average adult makes about 35,000 decisions every single day. 35,000 decisions. That's insane. Assuming you get eight hours of sleep every night, 35,000 decisions equals about 2,187 decisions an hour. That comes out to 36 decisions a minute, which is about a decision every one and a half seconds. Now, most of these are small decisions, stuff we don't really think about, like where we're gonna park, uh, where, where we're gonna place the pin after we're done using it, where we're gonna set our drink on our desk, that type of stuff. Uh, if you want to you know, engage with the coworker who's gonna talk your ear off, or if you just wanna kinda try to sneak past him because you're, you're grumpy because you skipped your coffee. <laughs> we make thousands, tens of thousands of these decisions every single day. And it can become daunting. There's actually a thing called decision fatigue. That's why like a lot of high level CEOs like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs when he was alive would just wear the same outfit every day. They'd have like multiple of these outfits and just put on the same thing and they kind of streamline their life. So whenever they do have to make these important decisions with their business, they didn't have to be bogged down by the tedious decisions they made earlier that morning. Life is full of decisions. The most important decision is who we're gonna follow. Are we gonna follow Christ or are we gonna follow the world? That is the most important decision that we're gonna make. And when we make the decision to follow Christ, sometimes there are gonna be these little course adjustments and sometimes there are gonna be big course adjustments. And that's what we see with Lot and his family. See, they were settled into Sodom and Abram and, and his family and People before that in the chapters before had already fled from the city because of its wickedness, but Lot chose to stay. And the Bible says that Lot was still a righteous man, and that's why these angels were sent to give him warning to get out of there so he wasn't destroyed with the wickedness. But he chose to live in this wicked land. That was a choice that he made. He also chose to get up and listen to the angel and take it seriously, unlike some in his family. Sometimes we choose to live in a dangerous place. We choose to dwell somewhere that we don't belong 
as Christians, as righteous people. And that's where Lot found himself because every day he woke up, he was constantly fighting against the world. He was constantly fighting against these bad influences. He was constantly fighting and fighting and fighting all because of this one decision that he made to stay in the wicked land. He knew it was a bad place, but he chose to stay. Second Peter says that the wickedness of Sodom vexed Lot's righteous soul from day to day. Every day, his soul was increasingly vexed. He continued to go more and more weary. He continued to be broken down more and more every day that he lived in this wicked place. So despite losing his home, the life that he had built, the lawn that he'd perfectly manicured, everything that he loved in this city that stopped him from leaving in the first place, despite all of that, the destruction of the city actually saved Lot's life, I believe. And that leads to Lot's next decision, the decision to go up out of that land when he was warned, the decision to obey the command, to flee, to run and not to look back. See, we can't serve both God and the world. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how strong we think we are. It doesn't matter how rooted we believe ourselves to be in our faith. We can't serve God and the world. We can't do it, it's not possible. It's not possible. It'll never happen. It doesn't matter who you are. It will not happen. It doesn't matter how many hours a day you pray. It doesn't matter how many times you've read the Bible over. It doesn't matter how many scriptures you know. You cannot serve God and the world. And that brings us to the first tragedy in this story. The fact that a righteous man was able to try and justify in his mind living in these conditions. We live in a fallen world. There's sin, wickedness, evil all around us. That doesn't mean we place ourselves directly in the middle of it. Yeah, we have to go to work. We have to interact with some people who definitely don't share the same values as us. That doesn't mean we live with them. That doesn't mean they influence us every second of our lives. We don't live right in the middle of their village. We don't park our tent with them. We don't. And that's what Lot tried to do. And I wonder what would have happened to Lot and his family if Sodom hadn't been destroyed. What if they would have tried to continue with this path indefinitely and his soul just gets more and more vexed every single day and he gets more bogged down every single day and he grows more weary every single day? Where would he be 10, 15, 20 years from this point? Would he even be living for God anymore? Would he even believe in God anymore? Would he still have been a righteous man? I don't think so. I think the answer is no. Jesus tells us that a man cannot serve two masters. It's impossible. We can't serve God in the world. How many times do we ourselves try to continue living for God while we immerse ourselves in these things that directly oppose him? How many times do we try to remain righteous, to try and have a healthy relationship with God while we keep going to sinful places that we know are affecting us negatively, while we keep doing things that we know are affecting us negatively. The things we do matter to God. The places we go matter to God. The decisions we make matter to God. Everything we do matters to God. The people we hang out with matter to God. The words that we use matter to God. The way we treat others matter to God. God cares what we do. We can't 
surround ourselves with sin on purpose, knowingly, and not expect destruction to come. And that's exactly where Lot found himself in Sodom. Now, sure, maybe, you know, we, we think that we're doing good for a little bit. We think that we're fine and we got it all under control. And we have a nice little balance going on here of going to church and then going to wherever else during the week. But it's not sustainable. It, it's going to get to you. It, it gets to Lot. It'll get to anyone. See, nobody backslides overnight. Nobody just wakes up and they say, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't believe this anymore. I don't need to go to church anymore. That doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow process. It takes slow cut after cut, that decision after decision. You keep making these choices and eventually it goes down the path of destruction. You wake up one day and you won't even recognize yourself in the mirror. God saw that Lot and his righteous soul was being increasingly burdened day after day. He knew that Sodom was beyond redemption. He had accepted the fact, that's crazy to me that even God accepted the fact that these people couldn't be redeemed. They had no desire for righteousness in their hearts. They were directly opposed to everything that God stood for and they were vocal about it. This is why God told Lot to flee. Now, Lot didn't know about this you know, a month, six months in advance. He didn't have time to pack all of his boxes nice and neat and get the U-Haul ready and dart out of there with his family with Sodom going up in flames in the background. He didn't have time to prepare. The angel came to him and he said, you need to get out of here now. You need to leave. You need to take your family and get out because we're about to destroy this place. This place is about to go up in flames. You need to go. He didn't know prior to the angel warning him that this would happen. He had no indication. This is where Lot makes the right choice in obeying, in listening, in getting out of there, taking his family and leaving. And anyone that didn't believe him, anyone that thought he was joking, he said, okay, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm leaving. I'm going. And he went. He didn't let anything hold him back. He took it seriously, and he embraced the new direction that he was headed in. Even though he didn't know what would happen, even though he didn't know where he was going, he embraced it. There sometimes comes a time at some point in life where God calls us to go into a new place. He calls us to go somewhere. We might not understand when he tells us to do something. We might not have enough notice. We might not have all the time to prepare that we thought we needed. We might not feel like we're ready. But when God calls us, we need to take notes from Lot and his wife and his daughters and get up and flee and listen to God without asking questions, without questioning it without second guessing. We need to be ready to just listen to God when he tells us what to do. He embraced this new journey that he was given, I don't know, maybe 12 hours at the most notice of, and his life was spared because of it. He was given specific instructions he, at first he was told to go up into the mountain, but then he kind of sharpened up his negotiation skills and he, he was able to go to this little village. But he, he was told to run for the village and he did it, he ran, he got out of there. He didn't know what would happen next. He didn't even probably know where he was gonna sleep that night. It's a tragedy that he tried to warn people around him and they didn't listen. It's the same thing that happened with Noah when he was building the ark. He said, this place is gonna flood and those people didn't even know what rain was. They didn't believe him. They laughed at him. They were partying and, and having a good old time while Noah was building the boat. And then it started to rain. And then they believed him after the ark had been sealed off. 
He tried to warn people. Lot tried to warn him, but nobody, his brother-in-laws aren't going to believe him when he says that these angels told him that they're going to send fire from the sky to destroy the city. They didn't believe him. Tragically, even his wife looked back towards the city and she was destroyed because of it. There are a lot of lessons that we can learn from Lot's wife and what happens to her in this story. Luke 17, 32, Jesus kind of describes, he goes, he, de- he describes judgment day and he talks about the story of Noah, then the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Luke 17, 32, he simply says, remember Lot's wife. What does that mean, remember Lot's wife? What are we supposed to remember about Lot's wife? Remember Lot's wife. It's not something he mentioned just in passing. It wasn't some crazy words. It it was actually a command from Jesus to his disciples and to us. And it applies to us today. We are to learn from Lot's wife so that we don't make the same mistakes that she did. We're supposed to read this and take notes so we don't go down that same path of destruction because none of us in here are like the sodomites. There's no people in here that live this life of blatant wickedness. We're all following God. We all want his purpose, but I worry that we can fall into the same trap that Lot's wife fell into. See, Lot's wife, if you look at it on paper, she should not have perished. There's no reason why she should have been turned into that pillar of salt. She perished even though she chose a godly, righteous spouse. She perished even though she herself was righteous. She perished even though God gave her a warning. She perished even though she listened to God's warning and fled away from Sodom. It seems like she did everything right here, but she still perished. Why? See, even though she had physically separated herself from Sodom, she was still there mentally. There was still a part of her in her heart that she wanted to go back. There was still some sort of attachment to Sodom, to the land that God called them out of and said, don't look back. There was some inkling in her that led her to look back. And that's why she was destroyed. It wasn't enough to physically separate. It wasn't enough to physically listen to God's commands because she wasn't there mentally. She wasn't there spiritually. She wasn't there in her heart. So it wasn't enough to just run away. And I wonder how many times in our lives we've ran away, we've ran and listened to the call of God, but then something in us wants to look back. Something in us wants to go back to where we came from. And we kind of start to peek a little bit and we take a little glance back How many times do we try to go back to that place of destruction that God called us out of? How many times do we look back at some place that God told us to flee, some place of wickedness, and it doesn't even have to be anywhere sinful, anywhere bad, maybe just something that God says isn't good for you, something that God says you need to be careful with, something that God says isn't necessarily sinful, but it's not right for you. How many times do we look back and glance back and maybe take a step back? Lot's wife was destroyed because although physically she obeyed God's command, she just couldn't do it in her heart. Something in her wanted to go back to Sodom. Something in her didn't fully believe the commandment to flee and not look back. We can learn a lot from Lot's wife. She disobeyed the command. Now she obeyed the first command to run away, but she forgot the part that said, don't look back. That's why she was destroyed. She was turned into a pillar of salt as a consequence for her actions. 
See, there's a cost that comes with moving forward into a new direction. Lot and his family had to give up a lot. They gave up everything. Their whole life was there. There's a, a cost that comes with following that commandment. But there was an even greater cost of looking back. There was an even greater consequence of taking a little peek back and, oh, maybe, maybe God was just joking. Maybe he wasn't being fully serious. Maybe it's okay to look back a little bit. Maybe it's okay to kind of think about those times back in Sodom. Maybe it's okay to just look back and see if it's actually being destroyed or not. I don't know what the reason she looked back was, but there's a cost with looking back when God tells us to run and don't look back. There are things that we'll have to sacrifice when God tells us we need to grow. When he says, this place isn't good for you, you need to get out of here. I'm gonna destroy it as a matter of fact. Lot's wife was so close to being saved. Her choice to look back is what destroyed her. She was lukewarm. She had one foot in, one foot out. She wasn't all the way in. She wasn't all the way sold out. She just wasn't fully convinced. She wasn't. And she paid the ultimate price for it. The cost of staying in the same place In this case, it was destruction, fire and brimstone from heaven. The cost of going forward into that village was something unknown, something scary, something new, something that we didn't understand what would happen. But the cost of being lukewarm, that was the worst. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be burned up with these giant fire meteors from heaven than turned into a pillar of salt. And I don't know why God chose to turn her into a pillar of salt. But I believe that the choice to keep looking back, the choice to be lukewarm, the choice to have one foot in, one foot out, is the worst possible option out of the three. It would be better to just blatantly deny the commandment of God than to be lukewarm, than to pee be going back and forth and be second guessing it. The cost of being lukewarm is the worst. And what does God say? He says, anyone that's lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's a violent reaction. That's not just, I'm not gonna accept you. That's I'll spew you out. I don't want anything to do with you. You ever get a sip of a drink and it's not good. You can tell, maybe it's like some milk or a protein shake. You can tell it's expired, you spit it out. That's what God said that he's gonna do with people who are lukewarm. Being lukewarm is the worst possible thing that we can be. You're either hot or you're cold. You're in or you're out. No second guessing, no looking back. Now the past is also a dangerous place to dwell. It's really bad to be lukewarm, but it's also bad to be trying to go back in the past and and look back. Now, I believe that what happened to Lot's wife was a direct consequence of her attachment to the past. She had some sort of an inclination towards where God had called her out of, and that's why She was destroyed. See, we need to let go of our attachments to the past, to the things that God tells us no to, to the things that God tells us to flee from. We need to cut ties altogether so there's no part of us that wants to look back. There's no part of us that wonders. There's no question about it. We need to be all the way sold out. Every action has a consequence. There would be a consequence for staying in Sodom, consequence for staying in the wicked place. There was a consequence for second guessing and looking back. Now, just like 
Lot's wife for whatever reason. I don't want to make her out to be this monster who didn't believe the word of the Lord because we all have a tendency to look back in the past. We all have a tendency to dwell in the past. It is just some part of human nature for whatever reason there can always be a tendency to look back. That's why it's important to avoid these stumbling blocks into things that you were called out of when you got saved. See, just like Lot's wife, if we're not careful, we too will look back to where God called us out of. We too can look back. The past is the worst place to look. You can't see in front of you when you're constantly looking behind you. You can't see the future when you're constantly looking at the past. If we keep looking back at where God called us out of, it's impossible to look forward to where God is calling us into. If we're not careful, we can dwell in the past. We can live in the past. We're not there physically, but mentally, but in our hearts, everything inside of us, although not physically, is still in that place. If we're not careful, this is where we can find ourselves. How much harm has been done because people live in the past and they can't move on into the present, they can't move on into the future, they can't put their eyes in front of them, they're constantly looking in the rear view mirror. Some people have cut off relationships, friendships, family, because of something that happened 20 years ago. Some misunderstanding even. Some people live this continuous cycle of regret because of mistakes that they made in the past. Some people live their lives stuck on who or what they used to be or what they could have become or what they could have done or what they did in the past. And they dwell on the past and it affects everything in the present and it certainly affects their future. We need to learn to accept what's in the past and move on, put our eyes on Christ, move forward, continue forward. The past is in the past, the past is over. We don't have to live by our past. We don't have to be identified by our past. Our past does not define us. Our future in Christ defines us. As soon as we were born in that water, as soon as we spoke in other tongues, as soon as we make that decision to live for God, our past does not define us. We can't keep looking back. It's not a good way to live. God's looking for people who are gonna, like Lot, move forward, run ahead to where he calls them, to where he tells them to go. Not even asking any questions, not wavering, not looking back. He's looking for people that are gonna wholeheartedly run into the place that he's calling them into. And that can be scary. That's definitely not an easy task. Normally, when God calls people to do something, it's scary, it's big. It's something that you don't think you can do. You don't know if you can handle it, but you know that you have this call, this commandment, this inkling from God, and he's looking for people that are gonna take that and they're gonna follow that, and they're gonna run full force ahead with what God tells them to do. It's becoming more important now than it ever has been. As the world gets darker, as the world just gets darker and darker, God's looking for brighter light. We're a city set on a hill. The church is a beacon of hope in the dark world. We are the righteous people that God's chosen to further their gospel, to further the mission of the church. And God's looking for people who are willing whenever he calls to run full speed ahead, to embrace that journey, no matter how scary it is, no matter if they have to do it alone, 
no matter if everyone else thinks that they're joking. Doesn't matter who makes fun of you. Doesn't matter if people think you're weird, if people don't understand. As long as God sees you fulfilling his mission, that's what matters in the end. As we can all stand and the music comes. The world we live in, we're just being pulled in so many directions. There's so many different voices beckoning us in every which way. Do this, do that, follow me, follow me, follow me. All these little voices trying to get us to follow them. There's only one voice that we should be listening to. There's one voice in our lives that should be overshadowing any other voice. That's the voice of God. When he says, this place isn't for you, this thing that you're doing, this spot that you're in in, in life, it's not for you. You need to run. You need to get out. You need to go full force, full speed ahead. When God utters that call, I don't wanna be the one that looks back. I don't wanna be the one that second guesses it. I don't wanna be the lukewarm Christian. I don't wanna be the one who wavers. I don't wanna be like Lot's wife. I wanna be like Lot. I don't wanna be so caught up in my own desires and my own will that I perish. There's the old hymn that goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As soon as we focus on Jesus, as soon as we hone in on his voice, everything else kind of starts to fade away. It'll still be there. It just won't be the overarching voice. I wanna be so focused on Jesus that I have no thought of what's around me or behind me or whatever's calling me, whatever's in the back of my mind saying, no, maybe, maybe God made a mistake. Maybe that wasn't true. I wanna be like Lot. I wanna run forward. Let's all come to the front, find a place to pray.